Hello, today we're going to be talking about relationships and ecosystems. So remember this idea of a niche, and that's all of those the things that determine an organism's role in the ecosystem, what it does, where it lives, kind of habitat it needs, etc. One of the things that goes into that is symbiotic relationships we're going to talk about more today, relationships with other organisms. Now remember that they, any organism has a potential or fundamental niche, which is the absolute biggest niche it could fill, but all of these other interactions actually cut that niche down so that they only actually fill what we call their realized niche, and that's going to be determined by a lot of these interactions with other organisms. So symbiosis literally means living together, and we're talking about two or organisms, which are called symbionts, that are living together in one environment, and they interact with each other because there is some sort of overlap in their niche. And when this happens, a lot of times we will see these organisms co-evolve as well. And many times when they co-evolve, they basically get into an arms race with each other, where they're going back and forth. Each one is trying to get an advantage over the other one. So this happens with predators and prey. The predator gets better at catching the prey. The prey finds new ways to avoid the predator. It happens with pathogens like viruses. They keep getting better at evading us as we keep trying to come up with ways to cure viral diseases. So this is all examples of co-evolution. And that's how a lot of these relationships have come about. So there are several different types of relationships you need to know. Mutualism is the first one. This is where both species are getting something good out of the relationship. So for example, we have lots of probiotic bacteria in our gut. We couldn't digest all of our food without these bacteria. It's good for both of us. We both get something equally out of it. Commensalism, on the other hand, is where it benefits one organism, it doesn't really do anything to the other. It doesn't help them, doesn't hurt them, they're unaffected by it. So one example of this is called foracy, which is when one organism uses another for transportation. And it's not hurting this nurse shark for the remoras to be kind of latching onto it. It's maybe a little bit annoying, but it's not really bothering it all that much. Another example is called amentialism. And with amentialism, what happens is one species is actually negatively affected while the other is not affected at all. So an example of this is allelopathy. Um, this in particular example is when black walnut trees basically release this chemical, it inhibits the growth of other plants. So it's harming the other plants, uh, but it's not harming the black walnut. It's might be considered helping the black walnut since it doesn't have anybody to compete against. Um, but this allelopathy is whenever plants give off a chemical um, to kind of prevent other plants from growing. And amentialism in general is negative effect to one, the other one's not really affected, might even be benefited a little bit. So one example of amentialism is parasitism, and that's probably the most common example. So parasitism is specific in that one organism, the parasite is feeding on the body of another organism, which we call the host. So an example of this is this lamprey, it's this jawless fish. It feeds on other fishes um, and it literally th things like this often suck the blood of other things things like that if you're really sensitive you might want to look away for a minute here's a human parasite example the bot fly this also attacks um, horses and livestock and it actually lays the eggs under the skin where the larvae hatch and then eat their way out Another example, tapeworm, lots of intestinal parasites. A lot of parasites, both human and otherwise, will actually evolve so that they have both a primary and a secondary host, and that host helps to spread them around to other organisms. So tapeworm is one of those things. It secondary hosts include um, mammals and fleas, and it gets passed around this way from mammal to mammal. Um, Malaria is another one that does that. It's actually a protist, but it is transmitted by a mosquito. So the mosquito itself is a parasite, and then there's another parasite that can be transmitted with that. 
Another example of a symbiotic relationship is predation. In predation, this is distinguished because one organism is actively hunting the other organism. Um, so obviously it's good for one, bad for the other. So this is a trophic relationship because one's eating the other. There's two major techniques that predators use, either pursuit or ambush. Pursuit means they're actively trying to find their prey. Ambush is when those predators are just kind of hiding and waiting out for them to appear. Either way, it's still predation. Now, prey organisms have come up with a lot of adaptations to try to avoid predation. So they have lots of defensive adaptations. Some of these defensive adaptations are more social or behavioral adaptations. So that whole idea that there's strength in numbers, where they all look out for each other. A lot of animals will form certain types of formations, get their young in the middle, and have the bigger adults that are be able, better able to defend all around the outside. So those are defense adaptations. Sometimes they're mechanical adaptations. There's something physical about the animal that allows it to defend itself, like the shell on a turtle or the ability of a, a blowfish to puff up um, or the scent glands in a skunk. These are all mechanical adaptations that allow them to defend themselves. Now, many animals are actually poisonous, and they will advertise this often with a warning coloration. Um, so they have bright colors, noticeable patterns, and this is supposed to deter predators. Um, of course, whenever something like this happens, you get the evolutionary copycats, the kind of lazier organisms, if you want to think of it that way, um, that use something called Batesian mimicry to basically look like the poisonous ones the best they can. These organisms aren't actually poisonous, but they look a lot like the organisms that are. So for example, this snake here, not poisonous, this one is. It's purposely copying that pattern to try to confuse the predators. Um, same thing happens with the monarch butterfly, which is poisonous, and the viceroy butterfly, which isn't. So these bright colors in nature are supposed to signal, stay away. This is not going to be a fun experience. Um, Another way that they can try to escape predators is by blending in. So this is called cryptic coloration or camouflage. And you see this in all kinds of different organisms. It can be really fun to try to pick out where are they, um, see if you can tell them apart from their environment. They're really very, very good at blending in. And this obviously is going to help them avoid predators. If the predator can't see them, then the predator probably is not going to attack them. Zebras actually do this too. They have this along with the social behavior, so they hang out in these herds. And the stripes basically make it very hard to tell one zebra apart from the other. So the lion knows there's a bunch of zebras there, but they can't pick out just one. Now, plants also have defensive adaptations. And they can't really run away. They can't go anywhere. So a lot of their adaptations have to do with physical defenses like spines or thorns or very tough leaves. And actually, most of their adaptations come in the form of toxic chemicals. So this is the formula for nicotine. And nicotine actually originated in plants as a way to kill off the herbivores that were eating them. Um, and it can be very, very, very toxic in high quantities. It's actually still a major pesticide that's used um, on an everyday basis. Another small group of insects can eat milkweed. Milkweed is able to produce some poisonous alkaloids. Those insects that eat it can avoid competition with other insects, and they're also protected because they become poisonous as they accumulate those toxins. So predators don't want to eat them. Now, organisms should not overlap in their niche because if they do overlap, then they're going to wind up competing for the same resources. So that's, of course, called competition. And there's two different types of competition. There's interspecific, which is between different species. So think of like an interstate highway that goes between different states. So interspecific between different species. And then there's intraspecific, which is within the same species, different members of the same species. So interspecific would be things like owls and hawks competing for food. We mentioned that example in class already. Um, and they find way ways around this by the owl being more active at night, the hawk more during the day. Intraspecific competition 
would be more like competing for mates. So a lot of the times with this intraspecific competition, you either have fighting or you have different coloration, different advantages that these things come up with. So there's actually two major types of competition. The first one is exploitation. And in this situation, if resource is being exploited, that means that one species is obtaining the resource first and basically using it all up and leaving less for the other species. So humans are a classic example of a species that always exploits their resources, doesn't leave anything left for the other species. Good example of this is blue crabs. A lot of our native shorebirds depend on these blue crabs for their survival, but they're just not there anymore because we're eating them. Um, canopy trees, uh, they compete for sunlight and a lot of times those upper canopy trees are going to outcompete the lower ones and it may result in not having any lower canopy in a forest, depends on the forest. Now there's also one result of competition could be interference instead of exploitation. So in interference the individuals are actively present preventing the others from getting the resource and that's usually through something like fighting. So again it could be interspecific or intraspecific. So with interspecific um, interference that would be something like lions and hyenas competing for food and fighting over it. Intrust specific would be when two organisms like bighorn sheep are of the same species are competing for a mate. And what you'll often see in individuals of the same species is something called sexual dimorphism, where, which is when the male and the female look completely different. Um, size-wise, colors, everything. A lot of times this is because of sexual selection where they have evolved to better compete for a mate because of these characteristics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, whenever two niches overlap, this competition is going to ensue. So there's basically two things that can happen when they start to compete. Either you will get to a state of competitive exclusion or a state of resource partitioning. And basically, competitive exclusion means that one organism essentially wins over the other one and it drives the other one to extinction. Resource partitioning, on the other hand, is when they can coexist together. And they do that by kind of splitting up the niche and getting a smaller, more specialized, realized niche. And that allows them to both coexist in the same environment. So for example, competitive exclusion, if you take these two protists, these um, paramecium, and you grow them separately, they're both fine, but they occupy a very similar niche. So if you put them together, this particular one is going to outcompete the other, and the other one is going to start to die off. So we see this a lot with invasive species and native species. Invasives tend to be very good competitors, and they tend to competitively exclude the native species over time, so that you start seeing less and less of the native species, more and more of the invasive. And they will oftentimes choke off the resources, remove them completely from the other species. Resource partitioning, on the other hand, they are sharing the resources because they're using different parts of them. So these coexisting species are making their niches slightly more specialized so that they don't overlap anymore. And this is able to happen the most often when you have an area of high biodiversity because then you have lots of different types of food available. So for example, these birds at the shoreline, which we'll zoom in on an, in a second, or in a tropical rainforest, a lot of things depend on the fruit in that rainforest, bats, birds, primates, but they all eat slightly different fruits and because of that they all get to them different ways so it allows them to diversify their niche a little bit. So here are those birds on the shoreline. You can see that they all eat slightly different things from slightly different areas. So this is another example of resource partitioning. They're all splitting up what's available. And again, it's able to happen because of that area of high biodiversity. This has even happened in very small ecosystems. Like here, these warblers actually all feed in different areas of the same trees, the same conifers and they just move into different parts of the canopy of those conifers. They nest at different times, they eat slightly different parts, and that's again an example of resource partitioning. 
Alright, so come in next class prepared to talk about these symbiotic relationships and categorize them a little bit. And then we're also going to start looking at a particular symbiotic relationship in coral and what's happening as a result of human interactions in the carbon cycle to these coral species. Thanks and see you tomorrow.